Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve Sci Cafe. Um, the Sci Cafe is designed as a series designed to share information about the science being done in Apalachicola Bay with residents um, in an and create a forum for science, scientists and residents to explore topics. Um, our program will be about an hour in length and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. If you would like to ask a question, you can type it in the question box, which you'll find um, there's a, a little toolbar and you'll see uh, a question, you can type in a question or you can also raise your hand if you wanna do it verbally. Um, today we have Dr. Sandra Brook with us. Welcome, Sandra. Um, she is the project lead for the Apalachicola Bay Systems Initiative, and that is the Triumph-funded program um, that started about a year and a half, almost two years ago. And uh, she'll give us an overview of what the initiative hopes to accomplish, um, <clears throat> what's been done so far, and what will occur in the upcoming year also who's involved and how you can stay involved with uh, what's going on with the project. It's a very important restoration project to, to all of Apalachicola Bay. So Sandra, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Anita. Okay, well, this is very strange because I'm talking to an audience, but I'm looking at my screen, so I feel like I'm talking to myself, but uh, lovely. So you should be able to see my front, front page at the moment. So as Anita said, I, for my sins, am the lead on the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we shorten it to ABSI. And um, as, as she also alluded, it was it's funded by Triumph Gulf Coast, Inc., which is a um, the administrative group for a pot of money from the Deepwater Oil Spill um, uh, funds. And it is specifically for um, economic development for disproportionately affected counties. So most of the funding from Triumph goes to things like construction or you know improvements or some kind of economic development. We're a little bit different. Um, this project is the, the economic benefit that we are hoping to come out of this project is, is that we would put the Apalachicola Bay on a pathway to recovery so that the working waterfront can come back to probably not the way it was before, but at least a semblance of its, its cultural history. So we were funded in uh, 2019 in April, and uh, we haven't done as much as I would like because of COVID, but uh, I'd like to give you an overview and uh, let you know what, what we've been up to and what our plans are for the future. So this is probably a familiar story to most of you. Um, the top graph here are oyster landings and the bottom graph shows uh, fisheries independent surveys and you can see it sort of bumps along until about 2012, 2013 and in the top, um, the top graph it sort of crashes down into 2013 and in the bottom graph you can see the sublegal and juvenile oysters and the, which is the top line of that bottom panel they crashed down in, in around 2012 and the, um, the adult oysters just kind of bumble along and, and are not doing very well. So in 2012, the fishery sort of collapsed and in 2013, it was declared a federal fishery disaster. And that helps to um, compensate some of the fishermen that are uh, affected economically by this, by this collapse. So, so what happened? Well, it's um, when a system collapses, it's usually not just one thing. Systems are complex and resilient, but we think that what it was, it was a number of things that came together, like the perfect storm. So in 2007, we had some really bad droughts between seven and nine, and the top panel there, that image is Lake Lanier in, I think it was 2007, but you can see it's, it's pretty dry. Um, and so the reduced water flows uh, from the Apalachicola River, increased the salinity in the bay. This increases predators, parasites, and diseases. Um, this allows the marine predators to move in, especially things like oyster drills, which can really do a number on the oysters. They, they're quite voracious. Uh, the diseases also become worse during uh, warm, high saline times. 
So that led to increased mortality, especially the juveniles, which are generally more vulnerable to predation, not necessarily disease, but certainly predation. And then you get to a point where if the juveniles uh, keep declining, don't survive, you will ultimately get a recruitment failure because there aren't enough animals in the system to supply the larvae to maintain the system. On the other side of this panel, you see you've got um, shell removal. Um, by harvesting, we're actually removing habitat. Oysters are unusual in that respect because they make their own habitat. So it's not like fishes where you take the fish away and, but the habitat's still intact. You're taking away their habitat. Um, and there was also some uh, limited reshelling, but not enough to compensate for what was taken. And we also have storms and things that move uh, habitat around, bury habitat. So you get into a habitat limitation as well as a recruitment failure or a potential recruitment failure. And that led to the population collapse. Now, uh, there is evidence for this scenario, but we don't truly know what happened. This is just trying to assess after the fact what had happened before. So there are lots of unanswered questions, no definitive conclusion. And the unfortunate thing is that even though there has been a lot of research and a lot of um, restoration effort since 2013, there has been no population recovery. And this is the disappointing thing. So there have been decent rains recently in the last few years. And as I said, reshelling efforts so if it was as simple as we need more flow, we need more habitat, we should have seen a recovery and we haven't. So it's, it's not really that simple. So what is ABSI? So our objective, our mission, if you will, is to try and gain insight into the causes of the decline of the Apalachicola Bay ecosystem, and not just oysters, but particularly the deterioration of the oyster populations to understand why they have not recovered and to help develop a science-based management and restoration plan for the ecosystem to help put it on a path to recovery. And we understand that no matter what we do to help the system recover, it's, it's the animals that have to bring it back and that's going to take time. So no matter what, how much money we throw at this and how much stuff we throw at it, the animals ultimately are gonna be the ones that rebuild the system. So there are four primary components of ABSI. Um, research, a development of a restoration plan, development of a management plan, and community engagement. A couple of comments here. FSU is an academic institution. What we usually do is research. Uh, we're reasonably good at it. The restoration, we are not in the business of large scale restoration, um, but what we will do uh, is to come up with some guidance for a restoration plan. We are also not in the business of managing. Managing, We, we have no jurisdiction, but again, we can present options for a science-based management plan. And community engagement is absolutely critical to this process. And I shall talk about that in a little more detail in a second. So research, uh, we are addressing a whole bunch of different aspects of this system. Even though oysters are the focus for obvious reasons, uh, they are not the whole. They are not the whole focus. So we are looking at um, hydrodynamics and all those water quality uh, aspects of water quality that will that influence life in the bay. The bay is an estuary. It's a balance of salt and fresh water. Fresh water brings in nutrients. This is it's a highly variable system. It's a balanced system. Some of the things we do may put it out of balance and that affects not only the oysters, but the other animals that live there as well. Um, so we're looking at the oysters, obviously, various aspects of their ecology and physiology. Mapping, connectivity, as in where do things come from as larvae? Where do they move to? How do they recruit? And then also uh, fish and other invertebrate communities. So we're looking at the system as a whole. What we're trying to establish is whether, um, I keep hearing the bay is sick, but it's really not clear whether the bay, the ecosystem is sick, or whether we are or are unhealthy or whatever term you want to use has been changed, or whether we are using the oysters as a metric of the health of the whole system, and that might not actually be the case. And then there's the human impacts, the fishing pressure and uh, the specter of climate change, which is two of them. There are others. 
So we take all this research, and so usually academics, um, they show up, they do their research, they run off and they, they publish some papers, and that's, that's great, that's, that's what they do, that's what we do. Um, but quite often, that research does not end up in the management or policy arena. So what we hope to do with all this research, this, these questions that we are asking are very focused. And so we will take those research outcomes from those focused questions to create decision support tools that can be used for management and restoration plans. So again, this is what I'm hoping to bring to this is, you know, I keep hearing the Bay has been studied to death. We don't need more research. And, and there has been a lot of uh, studies that that's true. But what there hasn't necessarily been, at least in, in recent years, is a holistic approach that asks focus questions that will feed directly into management and restoration. So that's what we're hoping to bring out of the ABSI science. Uh, one of the components of ABSI, which is kind of falls under research and restoration, is that we're building a, a research hatchery. And this is not for commercial purposes at all, although we're hoping that maybe some of the things that we discover through the research that goes on in the hatchery will benefit aquaculture as well. But it's to try and understand, um, for example, some of the early life history stages of the oyster and how they might be influenced by different environmental conditions and different food types, for example. Um, and we're also going to set these uh, spat on shell and other materials and use them as restoration tools to maybe augment existing restoration and, and to kind of try and kickstart the system. You know, when we started doing this project, we were told we don't need spat on shell. This is a, a process that's been used successfully up in the Chesapeake, um, whose system crashed a long time ago. And they set these, uh, these hatchery produced spat on shells and they put them out on the reefs and and it helps their 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 approach because their system is spat limited so i was told when we first started doing this you don't need to do that this is not a spat limited system and that may have been true back then but we haven't seen an awful lot of good recruitment for a while so it may be that the Apalachicola Bay system it is now spat limited as in there aren't enough juveniles out there to really get the system going again so this is what we're planning on doing. And like I said, hopefully using these, this uh, seeded material will help us boost uh, the natural recruitment and get the oysters out there. Restoration experiments. So again, like I said, we're not doing full scale restoration. Uh, that is you know, somebody else's uh, business. But what we are doing is using a variety of different materials you know, natural shell, some of the more unconventional things like these oyster catchers that are made out of jute line, covered in cement that can be molded into different uh, shapes and sizes and different structures. There are reef balls, which we probably won't be using in the bay. Um, there's lime rock, which has shown some success. Uh, fossil shell is an option, although it doesn't seem to be doing terribly well. And then again, you know, we're gonna be setting some of these materials with the hatchery produced spat to, you know, try and get things going, as I mentioned. And from that information, we, it, that will help us understand, the, the restoration trials will help us understand the optimal material, the optimal placement, uh, size, reef height, all these kinds of questions that, so we can play around with those different aspects, those different factors before we commit and, and I try and identify the best um, option or series of options. This doesn't have to be a one size fits all. There might be different approaches for different um, uh, requirements like for example if we want to build sanctuary reefs we might do it using different materials than you know a harvest reef so we're going to do these experiments and use that information to create a restoration plan and i just want to mention at this point that um, the fwc have recently received a national uh, NIFWF, national fish and wildlife federation uh, grant to put materials out in the bay and we are working with them uh, so that they can use some of our information to help develop their restoration plan. So we have we have a home at the moment for our information, which is the FWC project, and hopefully this will uh, expand into other uh, funds so that we can scale up the restoration even further. So management strategies. Um, again, we are not managers, and 
we have only just started discussing management options. So I really want to stress that it's it's not us that's going to be coming up with these management strategies. We are going to be using science to address whether some of these management options are viable and how viable and how they might be uh, accomplished. So we are doing this in collaboration with stakeholders, management agencies, and law enforcement. If there's no enforcement and there's no buy-in from stakeholders, then whatever management we come up with is doomed to fail. So these are just some of the potential management options that are on the table. Again, nothing has been decided. Um, we've just started discussion, discussions with stakeholders. So rotating harvest areas, uh, sanctuary reefs, as I mentioned, these are kind of set aside areas that are not harvested, that are allowed to function as the oyster ecosystems were meant to function. Um, and they won't be harvested and they will be broodstock reefs and um, they will be just kind of left alone to do what they do. Limited entry, that might be another option for management. Seasonal closures, including you know, a permanent summer closure, that's something that's on the table. And we do need reshelling programs. We need something systematic because harvesting takes away uh, the, the reef structure. So we need to be able to put it back, to replace it so we don't end up in a situation like we're in at the moment is we're, we've got a real deficit in, in substrate, we've seen this. So that's a, that's a real problem. We need to have reshelling as part of our management program. Uh, it should be ecosystem and a based adaptive management. So for example, if we see that the, um, the number of oysters on a certain reef starts to decline below a certain threshold, we can close that reef, give the oysters a break, let them build back up again and then open it back up. So to be more adaptive in, in our approach to management. And then we need a state monitoring program. Um, oysters don't currently have a state monitoring program. So we really need to get that implemented so that we can tell what's going on and we can get some hint of the status of the oysters before they, um, before they crash again. Community engagement, and, and this really shouldn't be last because it is probably one of the most important parts of the project. Uh, we have a community advisory board, which I will talk about a little bit more uh, in a second, where we planned public workshops, open houses, uh, to try and kickstart a, a shell recycling program to feed into that um, reshelling that I mentioned earlier in the management options. We have hatchery internships that we have planned. So um, I'm sure everybody is aware that aquaculture has expanded rapidly in the last few years, either as a response to the decline in the wild harvest or just timing, who knows. But, but aquaculture is with us and it probably is going to remain with us at least for the foreseeable future. But what we don't have in this area is a workforce capacity to work in the hatcheries and to um, take up the aquaculture farming. So what we want to try and do is contribute to that workforce capacity, especially for young people, and to bring them in to teach them how to raise the animals in the hatchery and to care for them out on the farms. So uh, that's one of our plans. And uh, we also have educational programs and volunteers. Now, I will say that best laid plans were completely thrown aside by uh, COVID in 2020. So we are a bit behind times on the outreach, but we are a community engagement, but we were trying to catch up using um, sort of more online approaches and outreach approaches. So what have we done so far? All right, so those are those are all great ideas, great plans, and so okay. So what's happened so far? Well, one of the first things that we did, because it's so important, is that we developed a community advisory board, and this was done through a fairly rigorous process. Uh, they, these people were um, our ultimate members were uh, nominated by people in the community as representatives of their particular interest. And they were interviewed and um, requested to be you know, part of the board. And so we ended up with a really excellent advisory board, I think. Uh, we have five members from nonprofits, four from the seafood industry, four from local businesses, three from local government, two from state government, um, three from federal government, and two others. I can't honestly remember what the others are at the moment, but, um, but we have a really nice spread of stakeholders that are very engaged in helping us 
uh, through this process. So far, we've had 11 meetings, most of them virtual, unfortunately, thanks to COVID, um, uh, but we have had some in-person meetings. And we also had an in-person Oysterman's workshop because even though we have uh, two, I think it's two or three active Oystermen on our board at the moment, we wanted to bring in a broader Oysterman group. So this is kind of a separate effort. And every so often we have um, an in-person Oysterman's workshop. The last one we had was, I believe in December, December 3rd, and we have another one planned for the end of March because we want to engage those, those seafood workers. So research, all right, so what have we done? One of the first things, that, uh, one of the first uh, projects I set up was, um, it's actually, we've got two hydrodynamic modelers and they're both called Steve. So these are the Steves, I mean, what are the chances? So we have Steve Lightman, who has worked in the ACF watershed for, oh, I don't know, many, many years, more than he would care to admit to, I think. And he is, um, he's worked with the Army Corps and he's a very, very experienced, he's an excellent modeler. And his task is to model the river outflows under different management and climate scenarios. Because the, the, the flow that goes into the bay is a combination of those two elements in a simplistic form. So we have different things that management can do and then overlaid on that is uh, climate, how much it rains and so forth. And then, um, so he'll go, Steve will take us up to the river inflow. And then the other Steve, Steve Mori, is um, he's doing a very high resolution model of the bay and the outside areas. And the idea there is that he can take those river inflows, he can incorporate the topography of the oyster reefs in the bay, as in you know, the bathymetry, what they look like. And he's gonna use that model not only to incorporate Steve Lightman's flow scenarios into the estuary and determine how the freshwater, saltwater, nutrients, and all the good stuff that comes out of the river, how that behaves, but also ultimately to create a larval dispersal model so that we can release larvae from specific places inside and outside the bay, and then we can predict where they might end up under these different flow scenarios. And Steve made these really cool models that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to give you a quick look. So the top one is, um, I don't think I can play them both at the same time and it'll probably make you dizzy anyway. But the top flow, the top panel is a, a high rainfall year, 1998. And you can see the, the blue is fresh water. You see the fresh water sort of dominates the bay. In fact, this is very low salinity, it's close to zero. But um, the oyster sweet spot, if you like, is between about 15 and 25 parts per thousand. So it's the greenish yellow area. So very blue is not good. Oysters don't like very fresh water. Very high, very red is, is not good because that's salty and it brings in those marine predators that kill off the juveniles. What we're looking for is this greenish yellowish area. And as you can see, if you float, look, look through here, there's quite a few of these greenish yellowish areas in a wet year. So, you know, there's, there's good coverage in the bay of those that, that, that sweet spot. So if we go to, we'll play at the same time. Let me shut this off though, because it makes me dizzy. All right, so if we go to a dry year, you'll see over time that it's dominated, the estuary is dominated by the red. And we do get some rainfall, you know, it's not completely droughty, but uh, this, was, this was a considered a dry year. And as time goes on, you'll, what you'll see is that more and more of the bay is covered in that marine water. And that, as I said, is not terribly good for the oyster populations. So again, I just wanted to show you visually that, that there is a difference in the, when, how the river in flows will change the conditions in the bay. And this seems intuitive and anybody that lives around here knows this already, but uh, it just sort of formalizes it, I suppose. So these two are working together and it, within a month or so, they should have, um, we should be at the point where we can start running these scenarios, which will be exciting. Um, so the uh, ANA has had um, instruments out in the Bay for a number of years, since the 90s, I believe, with a couple of hiatuses for hurricanes. 
So you'll see the ANA instruments are the ones with the um, in the yellow. And so what we did was put out uh, additional instruments of the same type. They're all uh, YSI 660 data loggers with the same sensors. And we put them in places that will help inform the model and also to fill in some gaps um, that, you know, these instruments are expensive and it takes a lot of staff time to maintain them. Um, so what we're hoping to do is to take our data. They were, we finally got them out at the back end of last year. There was a bit of a struggle between storms and COVID, but they're out now, they're behaving nicely. And so we're hoping to incorporate our data, or at least make our data equally accessible as the ANA data. We need to work with those folks to figure out how we're going to do that, but that data will be publicly available for whoever wants to use it. Um, and so what we're measuring is temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and pH, just as, as I said, the ANI folks are doing. The, uh, the CPAP, the uh, Central Panhandle Aquatic Reserve, has um, also has an instrument out uh, outside of our lab, and they also have one out in our Alligator Harbor. Uh, I'm not sure if they've replaced that. It went walkabouts a little while ago. Um, so what we also started to do fairly early on was survey intertidal habitats. So there has been some work in the intertidal. Um, Ray Grizzle did some mapping work and ground truthing work and, and it was excellent. But uh, what we don't have is the long-term sort of monitoring of intertidal habitats as we you know, do or have had for a number of years for the subtitle. And because FWC were doing their subtitle work, I didn't want to use our resources to basically do what they're doing. So I thought, you know, we can we can collect the intertidal data, they collect the subtitle data, and we'll share the data, and everybody will gain more for the same amount of resources. So that's what we started doing. So um, I remember going out with the poles and the tape measures to to map and get the the height of these intertidal areas and uh, it was buggy and it was hot and I remember thinking, you know, there's got to be an easier way of doing this. So so I went back to the lab and I started looking around and we came up with the drones. So what we did was we got the Duke University Robotics Lab to come down and fly their drone over all of the intertidal areas in the Absey region, which is not just Apalachicola Bay, it's uh, Franklin County coastline. That's our area of interest. And so they made these um, high resolution image maps and they made digital terrain models so we can look at reef height and uh, reef topography and try and tie in where the oysters are relative to that topography, which will help us understand what's driving the intertidal habitats. Um, what we discovered was that that drone footage was great, but it didn't give us the resolution that we need to really drill down and, and to be able to see you know, individual clumps. And once we can see individual clumps, then we can start using sort of machine learning processes to track the density of those clumps seasonally and between years. To try and do this with people is, is just so time consuming, it's, it's just not really tractable. But we can go out there and fly a drone every month and get an idea of the dynamics of these systems. It's not as, as informative as going out there and pulling apart these, these uh, clumps and counting the animals and measuring them, but it does, it does give us a sense of the, the kind of the rhythm of the system. So one of my students is a drone pilot and she's been flying at 50 feet above these reefs and you can see this green inset here is a digital elevation model that she created that shows individual clumps now we do need to ground truth this until we we are comfortable that what we're seeing are actually oyster clumps we need to go out there and and those little those funky little white squares represent quadrats so we put the quadrats on the ground we have people go in count analyze the, the clumps and then she flies over and then we compare the data so that we can match it up. Once we're comfortable that we have that cross calibration, then we don't need the people there anymore and we can just fly the drone. Okay, so that's that's the idea. We've started doing that this year. And the map at the top, um, sorry, I should have mentioned this. Those yellow squares are our intertidal habitat sites. So we've got Indian Lagoon, uh, East Coast, Carabell, and Alligator Harbor. And within each of those, we have five sites that we monitor every month. 
So speaking of monitoring, so this is something that was actually missing was, was that long-term monitoring. There have been a number of papers come out that looked at, you know, mapping and distribution of the intertidal habitats, but there's nothing that, that tracks them over time. And what I was trying to understand in this is, you know, what is the contribution to the entire system from the intertidal habitats? Do they contribute anything? Are they, are they sinks, just that get recruits that die after a year? Or are they actually contributing to the overall system? And this is important in the situation that we're in at the moment, where the subtidal reefs are in such poor shape that the contribution from the intertidal habitats may be important. So what we do is um, uh, spring and fall, we measure that uh, we put the quadrats down, five quarter meter square quadrats, measure the total weight and volume of the sample. Now this is destructive sampling, so we don't want to be doing it every month, and it's also very time consuming. So we measure the, the weight and volume, the total number of oysters and boxes, which are the recently dead articulated shells, which are really good habitat for a juvenile or spat settlement. So we're counting those. And then monthly, uh, we take a subsample from each um, study site and we measure condition in, with, well, we'll measure the shell length, width and height. And then we'll take condition index, reproductive status, disease, and we're looking for a derma, which is the chronic disease in the bay. And we also put out spat collectors, and you can see one of those. Uh, Chris is holding one on the right-hand side here. And they're quite simple. Uh, they're actually used by FWC, so we just shamelessly copied their approach. And they're a PVC pole, and they've got a string on either side with a series of shells. And we tie it, uh, we stick it in the ground, and um, and leave it there for a month, and then we come back, we take the shells off, replace the shells, count the number of spat on the shell. It's quite a simple system, but it's it's effective and it works. Uh, we also collect, collect environmental data whenever we're out there. Um, subtitle mapping. So this is a, uh, subtitle is, it's hard to get information, especially in a bay as murky as Apalachicola, because we can't use things like LIDAR and aerial footage. So we have to use sonar. That's the most effective way. The trouble is the bay is so shallow. So you have to do a lot of mowing the lawn back and forth and back and forth with the sonar to get complete coverage. So back in 2006, um, USGS, who was led by Dave Twitchell, uh, took the sonar out into the bay. Uh, it was a boat-mounted sonar, I believe, may have been a towfish. I don't re don't recall exactly, but they had they pulled they they created swaths across most of the bay, as you can see. Now they didn't get up into Indi you know, the miles and Indian Lagoon. And they didn't get up into East Bay, but they've got a good chunk of of the bay. And you can see the red areas there are the higher elevation, and the blue are the lower. You can see it's quite quite nice. They've got the the reefs are are outlined. Well, things have changed a lot since 2006 when they did this, and so we really need to understand what's going on now. And the reason we need to understand that is that if we have an idea of what it used to be when the oysters were at least in decent shape before the decline, and we know what it is now, then we can look at the the difference in those heights, and it will give us a sense of what we have to do to bring those reef heights back up to make the oyster habitat at least a semblance of what it was before. So that's that's why we need to know what's happening now. So the broad scale mapping is being done by FWC. They are out there doing some sonar work. I, I believe they've actually finished it now and they're just they're processing it. So uh, because the bay is so shallow, they're not doing what one would traditionally do with sonar in deeper water and do overlapping swaths. So you get this nice picture of what's going on. Their swaths are separated um, and, and they interpolate between them. So this is an interpolated map. And that's that's good. I mean, logistically, that's the, that's the best we can do. We'd be there until we all retire if we had to do every single swath back and forth. So this is a very good broad view of what's going on. So what we're going to do is um, very high resolution mapping of targeted areas. Those areas, for example, where we might still see oysters or areas where it looks like it's very spatially heterogeneous, that might be good restoration area that we really want to understand what it looks like so we can maybe fill in the gaps. And there's a number of reasons why we might be targeting areas for high resolution mapping. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come in behind FWC and, and fill in some of the gaps and target these high priority areas. And then we'll ground truth what we see, or we have been ground truthing, um, 
some of these known areas of oyster reef with um, tonging data to, or with subtitle sampling using tonging to sort of ground truth the sonar because the sonar will only tell you what it looks like as a bump. It won't tell you what's there. So we need to go and you know, sort of figure out what's there. So as I said, FWC has been doing subtitle surveys, but they have um, targeted sites for very good reasons. They're going back to the restoration sites and they're doing this long-term monitoring. And they're using SCUBA. So what I thought we could do to complement the FWC data is to get um, a broader view of a larger part of the bay using a quicker and easier approach. So what I did was uh, approached uh, one of the oystermen, um, Shannon Hartsfield, he's helping us do this. Um, I tried tonguing once, it, it wasn't pretty. Shannon does it a whole lot better than I could ever hope to do. So we're, we're, we've contracted him to go out and, and help us with this part of the project. So what we do, we, we picked a number of spots in the bay. Most of them were spots that Shannon took us to. I mean, he's got three GPSs full of numbers. It's remarkable. So he just kind of basically led us around and we, we subsampled this beautiful suite of areas. And the way we did it, so we wanted to be somewhat systematic and, and to be somewhat quantitative. So we came up to a site, we put the boat, the boat anchored, and then he did one tong lick um, at three points on either side of the boat. And that's what this cartoon is supposed to represent. So we have six samples per site and we put them in these bins uh, on the culling board. And then what we do is we measure the total volume um, and, of, uh, and then total volume. And then we divide it up by rock, shell and live oysters. And this is, these are quite coarse kind of um, measurements. You know, they're not exact by any means, but they are relative and they're consistent. So, you know, they can give us some useful information. And so the rock is, tends to be either fossilized rock from the fossil shell that's been deployed or the lime rock that has been um, used as cult. So then we have the dead shell, which can either be fossil shell or modern dead shell. It's really hard sometimes to tell the difference. So rather than agonize over it, we just said, it looks like a shell, it's a shell. If it's clam, it's fossilized, it's a shell. And then live oysters. For the live oysters, we counted the spat, the adults, um, the market size and the boxes, and we measured them and put them into these three size categories. So even though it was kind of quick and not, not nearly as precise as the diving, it did give us a decent amount of information. And so this is just a map, it's a, it's a bit busy, I must say, but essentially the size of the pie is the amount of total material. The red part of the pie represents live oysters, the green part represents non-living shell, and the purple part represents rocks. So this gives you an idea of the distribution of the sort of the material and the and the animals that are in the bay. And you can see they are sort of clustered around two primary areas. We've got the Cat Point area and a little bit of Peanut Ridge and a little bit down the south here in the eastern part of the bay. And then over in the western part of the bay, Dry Bar is a desert. We didn't find anything on Dry Bar at all, uh, the old sites, the old historic sites. But there are some oysters up on the northern part of Dry Bar and North Spur, and then some of the sites over in the Miles. So this tells us what's what's left and and uh, where we might want to and where the oysters are actually doing okay, not well, but there are oysters there, and where we might want to uh, focus our restoration efforts and our research. You know, Dry Bar used to be a great spot. Why isn't it anymore? We need to have some research out there to try and understand whether it's just a habitat problem, whether there's something about the environment that the oysters just, they just don't thrive there anymore, whether it's a recruitment issue. So now that we have a picture of what's going on in the Bay, we can start drilling down with some of our questions and, and try and understand why it is the way it is. One thing we do have to do is calibrate the tonging data with the scuba data so that we can create you know, real density estimates rather than just have these relative, um, relative proportions. So in addition, we've got a number of things going on. Um, as I said, this, you know, the focus is oysters, but we, we want to, I want to, we, APSI team wants to understand whether the changes in the bay 
uh, reflected in other parts of the system. So I have somebody looking at a, a grad student looking at community changes in fish populations using the FWC fisheries independent monitoring data, looking at those populations over time and correlating that with river flow. So we're seeing a weak correlation. So um, Justin is now drilling down seasonally and uh, or temporarily and spatially at a higher resolution to see if we can sort of get more of a sense of the short-term influences of river flows on some of these fish populations. Uh, we also have a project that's assessing the genetic population structure of the oysters within and outside the ABSI region. So um, previous data or existing data indicates that there's a genetic break uh, between the Big Bend area and areas west of Panama City and that Apalachicola seems to be a transition zone, which is interesting, but can make things a little bit more complicated. And there's actually a, an urgency to, to this at the moment to try and understand whether is the Apalachicola Bay just one big population that's just kind of swilling back and forth and there's no population structure at all and it's just one big happy you know, population family, or are there separate parts of the system that are adapted to specific environmental conditions in that system? And an example is Alligator Harbor. Alligator Harbor is a very salty, warm, occasionally hypoxic system. And there are oysters out there in the subtidal area that are six inches long, but they have a really hard time with some of the aquaculture cages where the oysters have, suffer a high mortality, especially during the summer. So that begs the question of, well, would we do better with the aquaculture animals if we use local stocks that may or may not be adapted for that area? And if they are adapted, can we maintain that adaptation through a, you know, a breeding line? But, we, but the problem is that at the moment, uh, with the expansion of aquaculture, there, are, there is a potential for diploid animals to be brought in from outside of the system. So we could be getting genetic pollution from animals that are allowed to be brought in, but are actually a slightly different genetic structure. So we might be losing or diluting some of that local resilience if it exists. We don't know at the moment. So that's something that we're looking at. We're developing a predictive habitat model for oysters within the Absi region. This is something that's been done for other areas, but we don't have one for Apalachicola Bay at the moment. And um, a project we've just started, and this was in response to a question by an oysterman. Um, we're assessing the historic and current levels of pesticides and heavy metals in Apalachicola Bay. Now we know that there's uh, urban input from Atlanta coming down the river. We know that there's agricultural runoff into the watershed. But um, so, and one of the oystermen said, you know, is it because of pesticides that are coming or, or other pollutants that are coming from up north? And uh, we didn't really seem to have a clear answer to that question. So we've started a project with a colleague at FAMU to, to look at that. And they were out this uh, month collecting samples. And then we're looking at isotopic values of oysters, fishes, plankton, and sediments um, to compare with a study that was done back in the 90s. So the idea there is if the, if the river flows have changed substanti substantially um, over time, then what one would expect to see is a shift from maybe terrestrial food input into a more of a marine input um, in the food webs. So rather than redo this huge project um, that was done back in the 90s, what we decided to do was take a few subsamples so that we can just see, you know, get a sense of whether there is change or whether it's pretty much the same as it used to be. And so we're in the middle of doing that now and preliminary information from sediments and um, plankton indicates that the terrestrial input for the dry season isn't much different, but we need to continue that into the wet season. And, and we should also be doing some more, um, uh, not complicated. The, the isotopes that we're looking at are rather a blunt tool. So we need to be looking at different types, a different suite of isotopes to really drill down into the food.
future research, establish research stations to test these, test multiple hypotheses. I alluded to that when I was showing you the subtitled data. Uh, restoration experiments, we're working on getting the permits and designing those. Physiology of oyster life history stages, so we'll be working in the hatchery uh, to look at some of these, uh, what it, the larval survival and fat survival under, you know, different environmental conditions. Ecosystem services uh, models, one of my students is working on that. Adaptation to local conditions, do we have any? And if so, can it be maintained through uh, brood lines? Um, substrate dissolution. Now, this is an issue that there has been a lot of material put down in the bay, and it's just not really there anymore. Whether it, there's a lot of reasons why it might not be, but we really need to get a handle on why the substrate isn't there and what we can do in the future to make sure that it stays where it's put and it doesn't either get blown away, buried, harvested away, or dissolved. So we need to understand what happened before we can go further. And then the high resolution mapping and priority sites as I mentioned. So that's kind of the research. It was a bit of a whirl through. So I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, if you guys are still engaged. So um, as I said, one of our objectives is to build a hatchery. Now it became very clear very early on that construction moves very, very slowly and painfully. So um, not blessed with a great deal of patience. So I decided let's let the construction go ahead. That's fine. But I want a temporary hatchery so we can start getting some work done. So we were on track. We were going gangbusters. We had the greenhouse up and things were going great until COVID hit and everything came to a screeching halt. And so we finally got the hatchery, the temporary hatchery up and running in October and we tried to bring the animals in and spawn and the boys spawned and the females didn't feel like it so we didn't um we didn't get a, a spawn off on on the autumn last year but we're absolutely ready to go and we're planning a, our first major enterprise this uh, March so we're going to be looking for broodstock animals mid-March and hopefully we'll have a nice big spawn in 2021. So this is the community engagement um, slide again. So uh, like I said, we've been working really hard on the community advisory board and we've got the Oysterman's workshops up and running. We still, um, I'm hoping that by the middle or the end of this year, we can start doing some of these in-person events because they are really, really important for community engagement. There is only so much Zooming that people will tolerate. We're thinking maybe public workshops in open places with small groups of people. We're trying to work around maybe the logistics of that. But this, we, we are still planning on doing these in-person um, events as soon as we possibly can. We're having a very small internship program this year. It's just kind of a pilot project using a, a couple of people that um, uh, we can we can bring in and help out with the hatchery and start learning the process and, and help the hatchery people sort of figure out what they're doing and how this is going to work. And I think I've just run out of steam. So I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Sandra. We appreciate um, the overview. Um, did you put the website on your last slide? Yes. Um, yes, and it is. Yeah. And uh, I the just lower right-hand corner, there's yeah. a website. Thank you. And uh, if you want to stay connected with the project, um, sign up for the newsletter and it'll go into much more detail. And like Sandra said, we're going to try and get more and more information out. Um, we have a few questions. Josh, you want to take us through those questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just take them as in the order that they were received. Um, so some of this is going to be jumping back a little ways. Okay. Um, uh, can you speak to how you're involving stakeholders in all steps of the process, um, including the research development, execution, and application? Yes. So as I, I said, we have we started out having um, in-person meetings every two months, and so you know the first part of that process was, to be honest, it was somewhat painful. It's uh, going through sort of developing our objectives, our strategies, our priorities. You know, getting feedback on what's important and what we should be focusing on, and um, just basically getting a feel for the community. 
and we've worked through that process. It, it was harder. Um, I mean, our in-person meetings were eight hours a day. Uh, or, or sorry, eight hour days. Nobody can sit through a Zoom for eight hours. Um, it's very painful. So what we did was we started monthly meetings doing four hours. So it sort of slowed things down a little bit, but we, we kept the momentum. And so what we do with this group of stakeholders, our community advisory board, is we they can request a presentation for something that they are interested in or thinks important. So we have presentations at every meeting that are uh, requested by the board. Um, I give a science update every meeting so that they are abreast of what's going on, um, at least, and can give me feedback on you know, whether they think it's a good idea or a bad idea or what else they should be doing for the research. Um, we have the FWC are engaged in the Community Advisory Board, so they are there as uh, to you know, receive questions and answer, answer questions from the community about um, you know, any kind of management issue. As then that was especially important when they were talking about closing the fishery. So they were there to sort of you know, answer those questions. And what we, what we hope the Community Advisory Board the, the function it serves is to represent the stakeholders to us, but also to represent us to the stakeholders so that they are a conduit between, you know, FF, FSU, rarefied academia stuck down at the lab and the people in Apalachicola. So that's, so that, that's the, the a very important part of the stakeholder engagement. The Oyster Workshops um, were specifically to get feedback from the oystermen so that they didn't feel like they were just being told what was going to happen and they wouldn't have any say in it. So, um, you know, and since it was hard doing these outreach events during COVID and we, so Anita has helped us greatly and, and Georgia, and we, we developed a, a community, sorry, an outreach subcommittee that really sort of focused on, okay, how can we get the message out better? So since that committee is, been established. We've done. I've done a number of presentations through FSU, uh, WFSU. We had a panel discussion about you know the, the situation in Apalachicola Bay that I think was very well uh, received. And you can go on to WFSU and and download or listen to that panel discussion. So you know we're trying to reach out to the community a bit more. Um, I hope that answered your question. We actually also make all of our community advisory boards meetings. They're open to the public. There's a three minutes at the end where the public can ask questions, but we post them all on our website. So if you go to the ABSI website, all of our community advisory board meetings, all of the discussions, the, um, the strategies workshops, all of that, all of that more information you can possibly ever want to see is on the website. So I really invite you to go and take a look. And if you've got any specific questions, use the email. And one one quick uh, addition, Sandra, is uh, I, I do sit on the CAB, the Community Advisory Board, and we met for 11 months now, 20 plus people from all walks of life, many people whose lives revolve around the Bay. And um, we decide on what the goals and the objectives of the restoration will be. So it's it's hammering out all of that word by word um, over the past 11 months. And you can see where we've been and, and where we're going if you go on to the, the website. And as Sandra said, you can also see <clears throat> some, uh, you can access the meetings and you can see some of the uh, newsletters we've done, which try to summarize the meeting. So that's those are good resources on the website. But it and is a very broad-based group of stakeholders who are. It's kind of a bottom-up process. And um, and if you want on. to be on the newsletter list, just uh, drop us an email, and we can we can put you on the list if you're interested. Okay. Great. Um, uh, will FSU be the deciding agency as to what material we use as this culture? No, we we won't be. All we do is is um, offer advice based on the data that we get. So it's that we're we're purely advisory. All we can do is say this is the data. This is what we would recommend for this type of restoration versus that type of restoration. But um, 
it's not I'm not sure that we'll be making the decisions hopefully we'll be providing useful guidance but since we're not involved in large-scale restoration then we really I mean, we can say what we think, but they don't have to, nobody has to take any notice of us. Hopefully they will. All right. And then uh, would you briefly be able to describe the effect climate change is having on the bay and its oysters? So there's a couple of different um, scenarios for climate change. Uh, they, both scenarios have the bay getting, or the, this area getting warmer, um, but one, scenario has it getting drier generally, less rainfall, and the other one has it getting wetter. What they both have in common, is my understanding, is that they are both more prone to, or under both scenarios, we will get more extreme weather events. So the bay is going to be more variable. And, you know, estuaries are variable anyway, but animals don't like extremes, even, even those animals that can tolerate environmental variability. You know, if it gets too fresh, then the oysters are going to die. If it gets too salty, then there's a risk of the marine predators. So now the, the problem with, with climate change is the speed at which it's happening. Uh, you know, systems are resilient, and if the change is slow, they can usually come about um, and, and tolerate it. But climate change, the risk of climate change is it's going to be too quick. But um, the best we can do, and I mean, We've put in place uh, something that we're just going to have to face the consequences of, unfortunately. And the, and the best thing that we can do is try and make the systems that we are managing as healthy as possible and to manage them adaptively and to be creative about the way they manage and to pay attention. But, but yeah, that's not a very satisfactory answer, I'm afraid. It's a it's a large question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, we have one here from Emily White. Uh, when restoration when will restoration trials begin? Uh, when will hatchery internships be available? And could you elaborate on community education efforts? Right. So restoration trials. Um, I'm working with. All right. So what's what's holding up the restoration from FSU's perspective is is permitting. Permitting's a nightmare. So we are working with um, FWC to see if we can work under the FDAX permit. That's so, anyway, permitting's boring. But the bottom line is that um, I'm hoping that we can get something in the water by shortly after, or ideally before in time for the spatfall, the spring spatfall. So that will be at least something, maybe not the large scale restoration experiments, but at least something in the water by, by May. Um, so FWC, their large-scale restoration through this round of NIFWIF funding, they, they don't have access to that yet um, for a number of reasons, but they do have some money left over from the previous uh, culching efforts, restoration efforts. And so they have a, I think it's, the current plan is three 10-acre lots over towards the Cap Point area where they're going to be putting down lime rock. So that's that's the last plan I heard. I'm not sure of the timeline. I think it's going to be fairly quickly, but I don't want to speak to F for, for FWC. So bottom line, hopefully we'll get something in the water this, this summer. Um, there is a sense of urgency in trying to do this because the fishery has been closed now for, will be closed for five years but we're already into year one. And so we really want to take advantage of that closure to get some materials out there so that we can understand what happens without the artifact of harvesting. So we do recognize that there is an urgency to this. As far as the hatchery um, internships are concerned, so this spring will be our first uh, big uh, spawning event. And so we, what we decided was that this year we would just kind of do a trial run. You know, the hatchery folks are going to have enough on their hands trying to work through, you know, it's a new hatchery, so there's bound to be kinks. To work through some of that, um, sort out their methods, they're, they're new at working together, get all that straightened out. And then, so this year, what we decided to do was use FSU students as guinea pigs. And so we're going to bring them in, 
and uh, they will be, as I said, the guinea pigs, uh, so that we can use them to help develop the best approaches to the internship. So the internship will be available next year. So, and then education. Yeah, so what I would like to do is get some education programs um, online on our, um, on our website, but Maddie, our outreach lady, has been so snowed in trying to get a website. She runs the website, she organizes the cab, she does everything, she's a rock star. So, but, uh, but we are thinking about putting online education components um, uh, onto, uh, into ABSI and also for the Marine Lab as well. So that we're aware that even now, you know, schools are, are using online education a lot. So that's one of the things that we're planning to do until we can get, you know, the kids back down here again, which is really what we want. Great, all right. And then I have one in here from Raya Pruner. Um, it's really long, so I hope she doesn't mind me uh, paraphrasing a little bit. Um, I'm wondering if you have in, uh, considered including species that rely on oysters in your modeling, such as the American oyster catcher, which is uh, dependent on the changes in the oyster population. Um, and have you thought about uh, collaborating with the FWC Shorebird uh, program? Yes. So we. We have so our technician actually used to work for Aina uh, before we stole him away, and he is very linked into the shorebird group at FWC. We haven't formally done any of the um, association work, but I think that would be because we we're just ramping up, and I'm just, I'm not close to any kind of suggestions, and I think that would be a, a really good one is that we can if we can see a change in the shorebird communities as the you know the intertidal habitats you know, wax and wane i think that would be a really interesting thing to do we are aware of the you know the nesting habitats and the value of these intertidal areas to the shorebirds and we you know we make sure we stay away from them when they're when they're nesting but no we haven't we haven't done anything formal with that um associated species we will be looking at the, the um, so we, we're assessing the, you know, fish community changes and we have somebody looking at sharks in the bay and cow nose rays that are not as part of ABSI, but just as part of the marine lab research. Um, the, the thing that I noticed about the subtitle areas is that, I don't know how to say this exactly, but they're not, they don't seem to be functioning ecosystems, not as I understand oyster reefs, you know, usually when dive down on an oyster reef, you see these big clumps, and when you when you pull them up to the surface, there's all sorts of animals are jumping out of them um, because they're living in there in those little little niches. That is that there's none of that that I've seen in the some the subtitle sampling. And so I would I would as as part of the restoration monitoring to assess success of the restoration approaches, looking at associated fauna is i think critical because the ecosystem can't function you might be able to grow oysters they can grow oysters on those little lime rocks that have been put out there there's there's some places that got really nice oysters um not as many as we want but they are growing in their setting but it's not an ecosystem so you're right the the associated fauna i know your example was birds but that associated fauna component is really important to try and understand whether our restoration efforts are just putting down oyster settlement substrate or whether they're bringing back a functioning ecosystem with all those associated ecosystem services. That's a really good question. Okay, well, thank you. We're, we're over a little bit, so we'll- Sorry, um, I do but, tend to- No, but that's off. fine. We, no, everybody's really enjoying the questions, so. But first of all, I'd, I'd love to thank Sandra for, for being here and uh, doing your presentation and encourage everybody to go to the website at the bottom of the slide, um, sign up for the newsletter and stay involved because it is, uh, is rooted in, in the community. So uh, I'd like, also like to thank Josh Eaton for uh, doing the, the tech um, production and the questions. So, and I wanted to invite you to our next Sci Cafe, which will be March 25th. And we'll have Jeff Beal with Ducks Unlimited. He's gonna be talking about a restoration um, 
program, the MK Ranch restoration, which is just off the Apalachicola River. And um, they've got some money to restore that. It was an old shrimp farm and bring it back to its natural condition. So that'll be March 25th. And we thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.